Yep. Okay. Welcome to the last lecture in this class. Um, we're going to talk more about surpluses. So let me just recap from last time. So you'll notice that as this course has come along, we've sort of got less and less precise about the definitions. Um, we gave you some solid definitions, but as the structure kind of, add, kind of adds up, it becomes more and more difficult to state the definition, um, and it requires more time sitting with that formal structure to really get a hold of what that definition, how that definition unpacks into something intuitive. Um, but, and so in this last two lectures, we're talking about turposes, but we're not actually defining a turpos. Um, instead, I just want to get the idea across about what a turpos is trying to capture, because it's important with all these formal structures not to lose sight of, that, of what the underlying intuition, underlying core that we're trying to capture, what we're trying to model with, with these ideas. Um, so, in particular, there are sort of two slogans that we came across yesterday. First is that a turpos is a category that is like the category of sets. Um, so we sort of we saw these constructions in the category of sets, but using the sort of language of of turposes. And I'll, I'll say more about that in a second. Um, but the second thing to keep in mind is that why we're, one of the reasons. So why do we want categories like set? Well, one of the things we do in set is, is logic. Um, set is a great place to formalize logic. And so we, what we're trying to capture when we say like set is that we're trying to capture the logical aspects. The topos is a place uh, in which you can do logic. By logic here, I mean more precisely uh, something like first order intuitionistic predictive logic. Um, but well, we'll see that as we go across. So, without a definition, we sort of do want to know at least, if not exactly what a topos is formally, what sort of things it has. So, so properties of a topos. So that these include uh, these four things. So limits and co-limits, turpuses have limits and co-limits. They have epimonic factorizations. So this generalizes the fact that every function can be seen as an a surjection followed by an injection. Um, they have exponential objects. So um, David wrote that Cartesian closed, but what this means is there's an object that represents, uh, in the category of sets, the functions, the, set, the functions from H, x to y form themselves a set. And so we want that sort of property in a topos. Um, and the last thing um, is, is the subobject classifier. Um, they have include, I don't know, a subobject classifier. And this was the thing that David called a super dense nugget from outer space, um, but is, is something that sort of contains the, the core of the logic. Um, so, let's see. So how can, how can logic be phrased in terms of this structure? Well, the We have this idea that the truth values, um, or the subobject to us by is sort of the general, general emotional truth value. So what do I mean by this? In set, so if we call this subobject um, classifier omega, um, in set, omega is a two-element set, which we think of as true or false. Um, so it's a two-element set equipped, well, omega is, a, is a, a, an object, but also equipped with a, a morphism from the terminal object, which exists because we have limits. 
Um, and that term model, term, that morsel from the terminal object in set picks out the, the element true. So once we have this notion of, of truth values, what else, we, something else that we want to do logic is to, to talk about logical operations, so sort of binary logical operations. And so these get generalized as maps from the, the sub-object classifier product with the, the, itself to itself. Right? So for example, and is an operation from uh, omega true false times true false to true false. But how do we build something like this? Right? How do we get hold of abstractly of some notion, some morphism like this called and? Right? This is also permitted by the structure of this category because we have this special map uh, from one to omega called true. Um, and this gives us, because of products, a map from one to omega times omega called true paired with true. And by the property of sub-object classifiers, um, a sub-object, so this happens to be a, a monomorphism, so it happens to represent a sub-object. And maps, a sub-object of uh, an object are the same as maps from the object to omega. So this thing which we phrased in the abstract structure that we want every topos to have gives us a, a special map called and from omega cross omega to omega. Similarly, so this is how we get and, we pick a special sub-object for this. Similarly, if we want all, we saw that um, we're again looking for a map, for a map out of omega times omega to omega. So we can try and construct such a map used by constructing a sub-object of that. Um, and perhaps it's no surprise, given our, our discussion of meets and joins and, and products, the limits gave us and, and is a meet, uh, which is a limit. Uh, or is given by some sort of co-producty or, or co-limity construction, uh, which is like a join, but it's it's a bit more complicated, uh, and we have to use more of the structure of the topos. So we have uh, this co-product. Each of the, the, these things is equipped with a map to omega times omega. Um, so we get a map here, but we also have this factorization system. So we can factor this um, to get a particular sub-object of omega times omega. And that's how we get from this, again by the properties of sub-object classifier, we get a map to the sub-object classifier. And so this, well, this is and, this thing here is or. Um, so in other words, or is the unique map, map here that makes this a pullback square, and or is the unique map that makes this a pullback square. Oh, it's the bottom one. It's oh, the sorry. Square. Thanks. Thanks. This. Well. Okay, so if you believe your category has these things, then I can tell you what my tru your, your truth values are, and I can tell you how to do and, and or, and uh, sort of a whole lot of logical, other logical operations you want. Negation, uh, universal quantification, existential quantification, and so on. And by the abstract, Properties that these things obey, these things will not only sort of, I not only get, say, a binary operation, but this binary operation behaves like and in the sense that it interacts with all in a distributed way, like it, it does. So you can prove this abstractly in any topos. So I'm trying to axiomatize a structure that tells me what I like about the category of sets. But this is not useful or not. Um, not so interesting unless I can give you more toposes. Right? It's no point trying to axiomatize uh, a group if the only group that you uh, that exists is the natural numbers. You're not doing group theory; you'd you just be doing number theory. Right? Which is theory not a group. The, what? Which is not a group. Which is not a group. <laughs> it's a group under a, no. No, the natural number. No, yeah, no, okay, it's a monoid. <laughs> okay, well, you're not doing group theory anyway. Um, so the question now is how to construct topos. Okay. Are, there, are there interesting examples of topos? Um, okay. So for this, I'm going to take what may seem like a, a bit of a detour to talk about sheaves. 
particular, I'm going to talk about topological spaces. So I expect many of you know what these are, but I'm going to recap the definition and try and make it relate to what we're talking about. So what is a topological space? A topological space is a set, so let's call it x and then OP. So it's a set x and then a subset um, OP for opens of the power set of x, so it's a set of subsets of x um, such that the empty set, which is a subset of x, exists in OP um, and the whole set is also exists in OP, so I'm just going to say open. So these two sets are open. Um, if we have two sets that are open, then the intersection is open. And if we have a bunch of sets, um, so indexed by some big set i, if, if these are all open, then the union is open. So a, it's a set. Uh, a topology on a set X is a set of subsets that contains the empty set, the whole set, that's closed under binary or, in fact, finite intersection and arbitrary union. Okay. Um, we should note that this, this set of opens uh, is a preorder. It's a preorder ordered by, in fact, it's a partial order uh, where we order things by inclusion. Uh, which is the order inherited from the power set. So, for example, um, I mean, one example we can pick is for any set X, we can pick a set of opens to be the, the power, be all, all subsets. So this is a topology, or a topology. Um, and then another well-known example of topological spaces is this um, is Euclidean space, or like R to the n for any n, uh, where the open sets are sort of these things that are generated by open intervals. So uh, open, I guess, cubes now. So if it's R, um, we have this notion of an open interval. So the topology, I'm going to write these angle brackets for generated by. Um, we say that every, we have a line, we say that if you have two points and consider everything include, uh, inside them, um, between them, then that's an open set, and then we close under these operations of union and, and intersection. Uh, so we don't need to worry so much about intersection in this example, because we intersect two open set towards it's still an open interval, but we can take unions of them in the real line. Um, and then for higher dimensional spaces, instead of using these, these intervals, you use cubes. Okay, but why this is relevant to what we're talking about here is that the idea is that the open sets um, form, well, let's just say they can be thought of as generalized truth values. So, one way to think of this is just that if you have a space, um, this is a space in which sort of queries can live, uh, then you can ask, well, where is something true? And the sort of possible answers to that are just some open set. So this is some open set U inside X. Um, and that's some way you might want to answer questions about, about truth, like where is it raining? It's raining in this area around Boston. But to be a notion of truth value, uh, truth values have more, more structure than just being, um, being there, right? They have more structure than just a set. You can sort of add in truth values and all truth values and so on. So how does that play out in, in this world of where our open sets can be thought of as truth values? Well, we have these things, this, this post set here is not just a post set. It has a top element, it has a bottom element. Uh, it has 
meets and it has joins. Um, at least finite meets. And so we can use these to think about, we, we've previously seen the analogy between meets and and and, and joins and or and so on. And so we, we use that to interpret these things as, as truth values. Um, so you can think of the intersection of two open sets as the asking and, right? If you ask, where is it raining, and the answer is here, and you ask, where is it cold, um, and the answer is there, then in the intersection, it's where it's raining and cold. Um, this logic is, it's not completely this sort of Boolean logic that you're um, used to, and then that's sort of a good thing, because if it had all the same properties of a Boolean logic, then it would be no more general. Um, the property, one of the important properties that we lose is, uh, what's the name for it? Law of excluded middle? Law of excluded middle, yeah. Uh, so, um, in particular, let me tell you what negation is. So, if you have um, not u, so you have some open set u, and you ask for not u. So this is a map from the opens to the opens. Um, and what open set should this be? It's the open set, um, it's the interior of, interior of x minus u. So I, that, that means that if we consider the complement of u, it's the largest open set contained in the complement. Okay. So, uh, let me just move on to this board for a moment. Um, if we have, so why, what is the law of the excluded middle? Oh, yeah, okay. Um, one way of stating it is that for, for Boolean truth value is not not, something is equal to that thing, right? If something's not not true, it's true. But you can, this is not the case in this, this logical structure here given by open sets. Right? So if we just take, say, the real numbers, uh, you might notice that if you take the real numbers minus just the point zero, that's an open set. Um, it's the union of two intervals, the positive numbers and the negative numbers. Um, if we take the complement of that, that's um, that's my notation for complement. Um, it's zero. It's just this point, and that has no open sets inside it. So the interior of the complement is is empty. So not. Um, so if we talk about so not not r minus zero, that's equal to not of the empty set, which is equal to the whole set. So we see some sort of closure happening where not not of, of this open set is bigger. Um, this this may or may not be a, a bad property of logic, depending on, or a good property of logic, depending on our applications, but. Uh, it's, it's not sort of as uncommon as you might sort of naively expect. Uh, for example, if you're sort of not unhappy, uh, <coughs> this is not really the same as happy. Right? So we sort of naturally use these expressions that don't obey this law of double negation or law of excluded middle. Okay. And in general, u implies not not u. In general, you implies not not you. Yeah. Okay. So if you're happy, say that that's true. Then so you're happy, not if you're happy, you're not unhappy. It's nice to know that it works for that. Okay. So the idea of a topological space, or at least the idea of the post set of opens, which um, you might call a heighting algebra, I guess. Uh, gives us a notion, a generalized notion of truth values. But logic is not just about truth values, right? Predicate logic, or the, the logic that we do in the category of sets, also involves like predicates, propositions, things that we can, uh, or, or subsets, things that we can evaluate the truth of. So how do we bring that into the picture once we generalize the notion of truth values? <coughs> Let me run back over here. Okay. 
So, uh, we have, let me give you a string of definitions. Um, first, a pre-sheaf on a topological space X with opens is just a functor. Um, it's a functor from the opposite, so this is just a pre-order, the open sets form a pre-order, we take the opposite pre-order and we take a functor to set. And I'll call this in S. Um, yes, that's the notation looks like here. Okay, so So what does this do? It takes every open set and assigns uh, a set which we might think of as the, the possible behaviors, observations that can live on, on that part of our space. Right. Um, so in particular, that's what it would do as a function, but now we also have to think about what makes it a functor. And so a pre-sheaf not only gives us a set of behaviors for every open set, but it gives us away, what is the order here? We have a morphism from u to v if um, u contains v. Right. Um, so what this means is we need a function from this thing maps to a function from the, the set of behaviors at u to the set of behaviors at v. Sorry, this is getting a bit small. Um, and we write that function if we have some little s in here, we write that function as the image of that function as s restricted to, to v. Right? There's no ambiguity because there's only a unique morphism from u to v. So if we start with an element of s and one to an element of v, sorry, if we start with an element of s of u and one to an element of s of v, then there's only a, a unique method we have using this functor. Okay, so we call this this map the restriction map from, from U to V. Now, um, so next I want to tell you what a covering is. So Actually, could you hmm? Sorry. could you just give an example? Give an example. Okay. Like weather or sure. maybe, maybe not. Uh, if you have if you want some example like that, then if you have the globe, say. Uh, you can ask sort of what's going on here in terms of weather. And so you'll get, you, you query that space and it tells you, it sort of, I don't know, uh, it tells you everything that's going on in North America, that might be. Um, but knowing what's going on in North America entails uh, something that's going on in the, uh, on the Northeast Corridor, right? So if you know, the weather in North America, there's a function that will show you the weather in the Northeast. Okay. Um, so the next notion I want to talk about is a covering. Um, so let's just say we say a set of open sets um, covers the union. Um, so I'm going to write a big U, and this is going to be just the U of its things. So you imagine uh, these diagrams in some color. Um, you imagine you have a bunch of open sets, and they cover sort of this entire entire space. It's it's sort of a very intuitive geometric notion, or topological notion. But what this notion allows us to talk about is a matching family. So um, if we pick if we pick some some cover, um, okay, so if we pick some cover, we say that a choice of elements of each of this cover, so describing say the, the weather over this region and this region and this region and this region. 
Um, so we say SI and UI is a matching family if um, for all the things in this indexing set, when we restrict the behavior um, on UI to its intersection with UJ, it's the same as the restriction of the behavior on UJ to the intersection of UI and UJ. Um, so that is, it's it's not that interesting if I say it's um, I know winter here and summer here, um, but if I if I know it's sort of um, it's more interesting. It's a more sort of feasible behavior for the whole thing if we say it's sort of winter in both places, um, and then it'll be sort of winter on the overlap. That was a great example. Winter is not a weather. Yeah, winter is not really. You take a weather in the first one, a weather in the second one, to have the same weather when you look at the intersection. Yeah, what we're interested in, in knowing is, is these piecewise views of the world. Um, and we're interested in knowing when these piecewise views are compatible enough to, be, to think about forming a, a total world view. Right? So SI is our observation here, and SJ is our observation here, and then the restriction is this overlap here. Um, so we have two restrictions. One, the restriction from the behavior on, on UI to here, and one is the restriction on this thing to here. And we want to know that they agree. Um, so this lets us talk about, um, if they do agree, we then want to talk about a notion of gluing, which says that if you have a behavior here and here that agree on the overlap, then you <laughs> then a gluing is a behavior on the entire thing that explains it all, right? So, uh, again, we say S in U, which is this thing covered by um, all these UI, is a gluing of all these SIs, which form a matching family, if for all I, S when we restrict to UI is equal to SI. Yep. I think I'm confused about what the SIs are. Like, where is the where is the content of rain or sun? So it's the it's the function. We pick an open set. Okay. Your notation's wrong. SI is an element of S of UI. Ah, uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so we have this notion of uh, a set of open sets that match together to sort of cover a space. Then we have this thing of a local assignments to each of the covering open sets that match together. And then we can talk about trying to piece together the local behaviors to a global behavior. Um, and Ashif says, um, has this, this property that we might intuitively want. If we know the local behaviors on everything, then that uniquely determines the global behavior. OK, so after that string of definitions, let me give you a, a simple example. Um, we'll call this space T, or we'll call this set T, and we'll call this set X. Um, X has five elements, A, B, C, D, E. Um, T has a few more elements. Let's do uh, So T has apparently 12 elements. And there's a, a function from 
t to x that just maps things down vertically. So these three points map to A, these four points map to B, nothing maps to C, and so on. Okay. So how do I, I build a notion of a uh, sheaf from this? Um, so we're going to say, we're going to take a sheaf on X uh, with uh, the discrete topology, so with the power set as its top, as the, its post set of opens. So in particular, uh, I'm looking for a uh, functor from the power set of x up to set. What is this functor? I'm going to send uh, a subset u of, of x to what's called the set of sections. So this is going to be um, function s from u to t such that <coughs> if we do that function, then we do it. I'll call this function f, is the identity. So let's unpack that. Um, if a, b is, if this is my open set, then uh, a section, so an element of s of u is a, is a way of choosing some elements of t for a and b. So I'm going to choose this element and this element. Um, but I have to choose something in this column because it's got to be the case that I choose, and then if I project back down using f, I get back to where I started with. So I have these three choices for a and these four choices for b. Okay, so what is the restriction map, or what are the restriction maps? If I have some v contained in u, I need to take a function, a section from u, which is a function from here to t, and turn it into a function from v to t that obeys the same section property. But I can. So, how many sections are there on AB there? I'll ask that in a second. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, in particular, I can. Where are we? Uh, if I have some function um, S from U to T, then I can just simply restrict S to V and get a function from V to T. Okay. So as David was asking, um, yeah, why not just that question itself? Um, there's been a lot of definitions, uh, so I'll just give everyone a moment to think about um, the question, how many, or sort of, what is, describe um, S of AB in particular what is its cardinality, say. And then if, if you want to think about something after that, the question is, I've given you a pre-sheet, right? I've told you it's a functor, you it's a functor, but maybe you might want to discuss, is S a sheet? Why or why not? So, find a friend. Restriction here, right there, which is. Um, I don't know if anyone's going to catch it. It matters, but your proposed F equals identity is that it not, doesn't type check. What you mean is that you have U mapping to X, and mapping U up to T that means that you have a top. I might have a Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that condition says that when you go up, you have to come back down to where you started from. You can't just like miss the column you're supposed to go to. And that's why I think it's called a section. It's kind of like a cross section. Yeah. Yeah. And then we want to know if it's a sheaf. And that means if you take some subset of A, B, C, D, E, 
And another one. And you had a way of lifting this one. You have any section you want to this one. And any section you want like this one. And they agree on the overlaps. Is there a section of the whole thing that matches all of them? It sounds like you're saying yes. Or you're either guessing the question or guessing the answer. Oh, I'm understanding the question. Okay. Yeah. Are you guessing the answer? Yes. The answer yes. There's a unique so we have a choice for where A B goes and where D E goes. Then do you get a choice for where A B D goes? Or do you have a choice for where A B goes and where B D goes? If they disagreed on B, that would be bad. You have one choice and you have another choice, it's like that. But, if, but it has to be, if it's a matching family, so they agree on the overlap, then you can let the whole thing be the same. So it is a sheet. Yeah. 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 So maybe maybe this question, maybe some people can just shout out now. So how many sections are there from um, A B? Twelve. Right. And so and so what are they? <laughs> right. They're just all choices of pairs of an element from here and a pair of an element from here. Okay. So given that, um, we want to know, is S a sheaf, right? So let's, let's first think about what a matching family might be. Um, so if I also pick the open set that contains these two things, um, and I pick the section, so a matching family says for this open set and this open set, I pick elements of the, the free sheaf, which means I pick sections. So I pick, say, pick, say, this section which maps this the element to this element, and this element to this element. Um, is that a matching family? OK, there's a lot of no's. Um, and the reason is that the overlap is, is B. right? So we need to figure out what the restriction of this, this section on AB to B is. And that's just the function that sends this element to this element. We can also figure out the restriction of the, the section here to B which is the function that sends this map to this element to that element. And if you notice, these two elements are not the same. So the restrictions do not agree, and so they're not a matching family. But I could get a matching family by mapping, by considering this section instead. Right. So now I have a, have a section of A, A, B, and a section of B, D that agree on the overlap, which is just B. So the question is, does this have a unique, um, a unique element, a unique section over the union living over all of this? So is there a section on the union, which is A, B, D, that restricts to both these functions on A, B, and B, D? And the answer is yes, see, because we've just drawn it, right? It maps A to here, it maps B to here, there's a unique choice um, now, and it maps D to here. So if you make that argument in, in the general case, you see that every, every matching family has unique gluing on here. So this, this thing here defines a sheaf. Um, and it has this flavor of, for here are all our options down here, and these are all the sort of values, the behavior types we could have. So if these were just five places, um, say five cities, and these are the sort of classic weather options at the city, and for some reason city C has no weather. But uh, D is a, a nice enough climate, so it's always like sunny or less sunny. Um, B can be for Boston, because it's mostly terrible at the moment. Uh, it has four different grades of terrible, and so on. Ali? I just have a question about the definition of matching family. You know, you could have written it uh, S sub K. So if you wrote it as S sub K, are you implicitly saying um, that the U, the U, the U, the UKs, uh, all the open sets, or a matching family could be SKs of S of UKs for some restricted set 
Are you talking about a matching family as something pertaining to the whole topology? Ah, so you, oh, okay. I guess, did I? Which way? I mean, you can do it. Um, it's, it's just a collection of some open sets. Some, some open sets. It's just so actually so all of them. So those are different IJs and Is Um This is for all IJ and I. He's fixing up above the UI. The UI, I mean, it's, 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 it's a K, what's the K part about it? That capital I. It's his K. There's a capital I there. He's looking at UI with I and I. He's fixing some. Oh, in I, in capital I, yeah. in some index I. Yeah. Yeah. So here, he, over in this example, yeah. the red thing was I1, and the green thing was I2, and then I was a two element set. Doesn't have to be for the whole set. No, it doesn't have to be for the whole set. In fact, it's a much stronger condition because it doesn't have to be for the whole space, yes. right? We have to, it must have this structure for it to be down. Okay. So another a quick example um, is is say the sheaf of sections of a tangent bundle. So um, if we have some place, we seem to be in a very weathery kind of mood. So let's pretend this is a globe. Um, to each point in the globe, we have a set of a tangent space. Right? This works for any manifold. Um, but to every point, we have a, a set of vectors that say that and, uh, the wind can be blowing this strongly in this direction at this point. Um, so we have this sort of, for each point, we have this set of vectors, and then there's a, a map. Or we have all these vectors, all these which form the elements of this set here, and this map down to this the underlying M for manifold, but this underlying globe says sort of which point on the globe is this tangent vector attached to. Um, and then, so there's a, a sheaf that has the similar sort of construction, that is the sheaf of sections. So for every, um, every point in the globe, or every point in our open set in the globe, we want to assign the set a vector field on, on that subspace or the, that says this is what's happening with the wind on this point. And so a vector field also has the property, not of just being a function, but this must be a continuous map, a map that sort of says that if the wind's blowing like this much here, then it's only blowing somewhat. It's the, the link there is related to the vector that's related. Um, yeah. OK. So you're saying vector fields form a sheaf? Yes, I'm saying vector fields. All vector fields form one sheaf. the set of behaviors, the set of all things that we can witness on that set. Um, and so this leads us back to our notions of, um, I guess, behavior type and, and then logic. So. so how do we pull a topos out of all of this?
In fact, I haven't told you what a topos is, but one of the things that makes topos theory confusing is that there are two definitions of topos. Um, elementary toposes and growth and deep toposes. If you add, if you take an elementary topos and add a few extra axioms, you get growth and deep toposes. But there's a nice theorem, um, due to Giral, that says that for this extra list of axioms, which is not much longer and still has a logical flavor, albeit a more restrictive one, uh, these are every every topos is of the form sheaves x on not quite a topological space, but some slight generalization of a topological space that is geared to capture sort of less these ideas of, um, I don't know, space in that sense, but taking care in particular of notions of covering and what it means for, for something to be covered by something else. Yeah. Can you replace set by an arbitrary topos? You can replace set by many things that don't need to be toposes even. Um, so in algebraic geometry or something, you no, want and to get a, he means and get a topos. Oh, and get a topos. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, wait. Replace set with any topos and get a topos. You can replace set with any topos and get a topos, but you can't replace it with like Boolean category and always get a topos. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Why? Right. Yeah. Okay. And abelian categories are not at all relevant here. You just mentioned them. No, but I, 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 you can take sheaves in categories that are. Like, people often do take sheaves in an abelian value in abelian categories. So, I've just erased the word sub object classifier, um, but one question you might have is if sheaves x is a topos, what object is the sub-object classifier? We've said that this is a really important object in a topos. Um, and so, here's a fact. Can we think about it for a moment? Sure. Uh, it's not that long in the lecture, but why not? Why don't we pause for a minute? What's the sub-object classifier in yeah. What is the sub-object classifier in sheaves of x? But x is a topological space. Okay. Yes. Um, so I've told you <laughs> that we should be thinking the sub-object classifier is truth values. And that truth values are uh, still there. The characteristic way? functions of certain open sets. Uh, oh, wait, we want a specific. Characteristic mm. functions. OK, so, so we're looking for a, func uh, a functor from open. set, right? So, so for every open set, we want a set. Called omega. Called omega. Um, so what, if we're, if, we're just if we're considering the entire space, how would I answer, and I want to ask a question like, um, I don't know, what set, what, what parts of the space are happy, right? Mm -hmm. what, what should the answer be? What should the truth values, set of truth values be? Yeah, it, it should be. So it tells you where the where this expression is true in this space that behavior is living on. So it sends x, the entire space, to um, what are the truth values? They're the open sets. Okay. But the data of this this sub algorithm classifier should be no, not much well, not really any more than this function, right? But it, it, should, it's, it has the same flavor as we recurse downwards. So if we uh, ask for gen a general open set, u, where we can think about sort of things that are true on u. So here's x, here's u. So the answer to, to x is that we can, we can answer questions by giving any open set. Um, but now we're restricting, we're just saying, Given this, this uh, if we consider u, what are our truth values that live on u? Um, and so the truth values are again open sets, but they're not open sets of all of x. They're the open sets that lie inside u. Okay. So um, u now 
maps to um, sort of the set of open sets inside. Uh, I'm going to call this U prime. Uh, but I need a functor, and so I, if I have some sort of if I have some statement, um, where is it called? On, on x, and the answer is to that is that, but then I say, actually, let's restrict attention to u, um, and where is it called on u? Well, the answer to that is just given by the intersection of u and this set of cold places. So in particular, um, then, his restriction functions should be that if u <laughs> contains v, then it maps some open set u prime in u to just u prime intersect v. And that's, that's our logic classifier. Yeah. Which, thinking in terms of functions, is just restricting the characteristic function, right? Yes. Yeah. OK. So now I've told you that she's x on a topological space always forms a topos. So if we're looking for a topos, we're looking for a well to do sort of logic that suits our purposes, we've reduced the problem to finding an appropriate topological space. So going back to this example of, of temporal behaviors that David began the, the lecture with yesterday, we want to find um, a, a topos to work in to answer and reason about that sort of subject. We need to find a topos or a topological space where the open sets somehow represent answers to questions about time. So one answer you might suggest is just the real numbers. Um, so you can ask a question, sort of, when does something, I don't know, when is the machine working? And it returns uh, an open set, so an interval, oh sorry, a subset, an open subset of the real numbers. But that's not quite enough because that's very instantaneous. And if you ask, sort of, when is the machine working and it returns these points, um, you don't get a sense of, I guess, duration. All right. it's, it's much better to say that the machine is, you get much more information if you're, your truth values can say the machine was working from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. or something like that. Um, <coughs> so instead, uh, what happens to be good for working with and reasoning about temporal behaviors is to use the interval domain. Um, so definition, um, the interval domain IR is the topological space. <coughs> where the set is, um, the underlying set is real numbers. Sorry, no. The underlying set is um, the set of closed intervals. Is that what I want to say? Yeah, so I'm going to write du, um, where d is less than equal to u. So a set of pairs where one number is less than another. And then the topology um, is generated um, by if, if something's possible or true on some interval, then it's true in every subinterval. So it's generated by this, uh, these open sets of U, A, B, which contain uh, the set of all uh, intervals such that A is strictly less than P is strictly less than B. So we pick two points and the, an open set is the set of all intervals that are strictly contained between those two points. Um, so just to close, um, now that we have a, a topological space where the truth values capture some sort of intuition of what we want, we can build the topos uh, of sheaves on this topological space. And then in that topological, in that topos, uh, we can write sort of logical expressions. So we can write sort of predicates that say like, um, I might cut this short, but the for all times, and so this is some object in the topos, um, which you can in fact define in any topos for the real number object. But you might want to write some safety statement such that if um, D stands for say driver, and if the driver is in a bad position at times T, then 
want to say that there exists some time interval r, which is small uh, and um, such that, uh, let's see, such that for that time interval um, by as soon as for r has elapsed, um, some I think you want and or something will be engaged. Instead of implies. That's and, yeah. And some, some notion of thrusters or something to adjust our, our speed will be engaged. Um, so the point being that this is some sort of statement in first order logic. We can express these things. Um, but these, so these things, this thing is a, an object, a sheaf in our topos. Um, this is what's known as a modality. So these things are particular to the topos, um, this being sort of some particular morphism. But all this stuff is just defined in terms of the structure of the topos. So just like in, say, a, a monoidal category, we can interpret diagrams like this. Once you tell me what boxes, if you give me some things for these boxes, I can tell you what's in this box. This that abstract syntax of a topos says that if you tell me what's in these boxes by exhibiting objects in the topos, then I can evaluate what this entire object is. So it, it will, which will return, given some sort of behaviors about position and the thrusters, will return your safety guarantee, where, where the thing is safe, which you hope is all the time. Okay. So I've run a tiny bit over, um, but thanks for coming to this course. It's been lots of fun for us. Um, if you want to hang out, we're still here to ask questions. Although maybe if you have any more basic questions or sort of questions, um, say relating to earlier in the course, or uh, you might come ask them first. And if you've got a more advanced question, you might hang back for a bit just to finish off and give everyone a chance to talk. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. We're going to now present one more. One more sketch. Yeah. Um, yeah, please uh, let us know if you have any questions going forward. We're We'd like to build a community around applied category theory, so if you have ideas for projects or, um, yeah, just we're, we're here, we want to hear from you. So, yeah. yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you.